Callaby and welcome to the business of life. Look, if you're an American, you're already spending more money on healthcare than just about any other country on earth. The average comes to more than $9,000 per person per year. But ask yourself, do you feel you're getting what you're paying for or are you just dumping money into a broken system? With more information and alternative medicine than ever before, maybe you think you don't even need a doctor. But do you? Well, right now we're going to find out. And as always, we'll break down the issues in facts, figures, dollars and cents. I'm joined by a panel of brilliant experts trying to answer the question, what is the business of health? Well, let's bring up our first statistic. Two out of three, that's the number of Americans who say they're in very good or excellent health. But half of all Americans also have a chronic illness. Lena, I don't want to scare people here. What do we mean by chronic illness? Chronic illness is when you have a diagnosed medical condition. But I think it's very important for us to note that good health doesn't just mean the absence of disease. Mm -hmm. You could have a chronic disease like diabetes or high blood pressure that's well managed. Mm -hmm. And you could be very healthy. The second thing too is prevention is the most important thing to keeping healthy. Mm -hmm. And having health insurance means that you can see a regular doctor work on other issues that really keep you healthy. Jay, do you think we need a primary care doctor? I mean, you've created an app, right, that allows people to find information online. There's so much out there. I say no. Okay. I mean, you know, whenever you see a doctor once, twice a year, you change insurance, you change jobs, mm -hmm. you move from Brooklyn to L.A., um, you know, you're, you're changing everything. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in a lot of ways, you really need access to your data. Mm -hmm. that you can own and share with doctors. And how important is it for people to be doing some of that research themselves about what their conditions are? I think it's really important. You know, Dr. Google is available 24-7. Well, I want to ask everyone here, who here has ever Googled a condition that you think you might have? Is anyone willing to talk about it? Well, I'm not going to say what I specifically Googled, but um, <laughs> I will say that it kind of scared me because you kind of find the worst possible thing. Mm -hmm. So you Google like sore throat and it pull up like cancer or something. It's like, yeah. you could get scared, I guess. You know, the internet is a nasty little place for scaremongering. Yeah. Um, talk to your doctor about the right sources first. 80% of all diagnoses can be made just based on listening to your story. And that's why having a doctor who knows you and can say to you, look, there's something not quite right. The last time that you had this wasn't, wasn't like this. Mm -hmm. Or having that someone who knows you is really important, but you know your own body is, is critical too. Let's cap that conversation and move on. The medical industry is a big business with big money behind it. But is drug marketing tied to our country's epidemic of painkiller addiction? Take a look at this. 300%, that's the increase in sales of opioid pain relievers between 1999 and 2010. And you'll see that during that same period, there was a simultaneous and equal rise in overdose deaths from those same drugs. You know, I have a confession to make. When I was a medical student and a resident and practicing doctor, I routinely prescribed painkillers to my patients all the time. If somebody came in with back pain, with dental pain, and, and I thought there was nothing life-threatening, but I needed to treat their pain, I would prescribe them an opioid like Percocet or Vicodin. I mean, this is just how I was taught. I actually didn't realize what I was doing until I saw a patient overdose from an opioid that I prescribed to that patient. And then I realized... They died. They did not die. I was able to resuscitate them, but this was a patient who also had gotten addicted and has switched to heroin, all because of opioids that I had first prescribed them years ago. Drug companies misled doctors, misled patients. There were data, it's been shown, that, they, that drug companies actively suppressed data and did not present the full picture. But doctors are also to blame too, because we should have asked questions. And so I would encourage every patient, if you're given an opioid painkiller, ask, do I really need this? Is there an alternative? Mm. What would happen if I didn't take it? And what are the side effects? One of the abuses that I see in Big Pharma is the weird drugs that they're pushing on Americans are for like toe fungus. They're painkillers. They're everyday stuff because you can't give, you know, a $28,000 drug that treats cancer to somebody over and over and over again and make lots and lots of money on it. What you can do is give them an overpriced acne drug. Does that also affect research and development? Does that mean that these companies aren't looking into sicknesses that are only affecting a smaller share of the population? I mean, you are, you are hitting one of the greatest, like, evils in Big Pharma today, which is now companies aren't spending that much money on R&D. Mm -hmm. They're actually just acquiring older drugs from other companies and really ramping up their marketing and sales to doctors. And, and ramping up prices as well, right? Like EpiPen, for example, that went up 400% over the space of eight years. I know it's become you, like you a would, major you talking point right now. You would freak out if yeah. you knew how, how much this was happening. It's important to know that this, uh, healthcare is a business. Right. You know, uh, it's not a system, it's an industry. 
Okay, right? sure. So but we want people who are getting rewarded in this system to be rewarded for real innovation and real real good business. And isn't a 400% actually... price rise just greed? That's not business, is it? If Apple were to do that for the iPhone, they'd be lauded right, as amazing healthcare. business people. Healthcare and yeah, computers are the same thing, that. right? It's, well, it's, a diff it's interesting because there's still st shareholders to report to. Oh, come on. You know? and it's we like, have to decide in this country I don't agree whether with healthcare it, but that's the reality, is a public obviously. good or not. You know, I think the first step there is there are pharmaceutical lobbying industries um, there are hospital lobbying industries, there's health insurance lobbying industries. Mm -hmm. There's no patient lobbying industry. We don't have any power. We are this third party that is sitting on the sidelines. I don't agree with that at all. So I don't agree mm -hmm. with the fact that we don't have power. We don't have power if we believe that we don't have power. We but should, absolutely, yeah. And the bottom line is that we as citizens have to speak up and say this is not appropriate, this is not ethical, this is not humane, and we're the only ones who can make a difference. It's a great point, but let's move on to our next topic, health fads. Millions of Americans fall prey to diet scams each year, and this can even cross the line into criminal activity. In 2011, the Federal Trade Commission found 5.1 million Americans were victims of weight loss fraud in that year alone. To put that number in perspective, it's way higher than the number of counterfeit check scams and pyramid schemes put together. Then it, why is it so hard to prosecute? This is kind of hard to prove mm. because there's a lot of shame involved. No one wants to admit that they've been duped. Um, people want to feel like they found a solution that's not as expensive as staying healthy. A gym membership is expensive. Yeah. Eating organic food, it's all so expensive. This is the challenge. Yeah. One in three African Americans in Baltimore City lives in a food desert without access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So how can I tell them to buy healthy foods when they have to take two buses and then walk 10 blocks to get that head of lettuce? And probably and, can't afford it anyway, right? That's right. And also, if I tell them to play outside, yeah. but they don't even have recess in many of our schools, or it's unsafe to walk outside, how can I say that you need physical activity? So we have to address the issues of disparities from the aspect of what is it that the government is doing and what is it that the companies are doing as well. In Baltimore City, there are neighborhoods that are just a few miles apart where the life expectancy difference is 20 years, which means that some neighborhoods, a child born today could expect to live 85 years. Two miles away, that child born in the exact same area but just two miles shifted can expect to live 65 years. All right, let me take another question from the audience right now. Who else has got a question? Hi, guys. Uh, thanks. What did you do to your wrist? Can I ask? Oh, um, I'm a MMA fighter, sort of. And you fixed it yourself? You did this yourself? Well, when you choke people out, it kind of knocks some <laughs> joints out of place. A Have you bit. told your primary care physician? <laughs> <laughs> No, I totally Googled it and said, yeah, I should probably get one of these. And I went to the pharmacy and Wait, got it. Wait, but what if it's, it's a great. fracture? You say that's great. What if it's a fracture? Is it fractured? It but probably yeah, is. It is totally, it, it probably is. I, think I mean, I've fractured my shoulder before and I took a shirt, an old shirt, ripped it up, made a sling. Oh. Worked for two weeks. It's perfect. Right after that, it was fine. No, come on. Yeah, that's man. dangerous. That's I take a lot of bumps and bruises and the stuff that I do. Okay. Oh but God. anyway, Sorry. I digress. <laughs> Uh, my question was, how do you guys feel about the lobbying that the uh, Big Pharma does? Doctors who speak out like you guys would be actually pushed to the side. Someone would say, oh, he's a quack to get them out of the industry. If Big Pharma called me out, I'd, I'd think that it was wonderful. Um, I used to work for Ralph Nader mm -hmm. in 2006. Uh, he runs the only consumer watchdog group for the pharmaceutical industry. It's only about eight to 10 people, um, which is insane. Uh, to think that there are that many people, that few people, uh, really keeping an eye on what's going on in the... I've in never the heard of them, so that's crazy. Yeah. So, yep. As part of that, I wrote uh, about four petitions to the FDA, uh, successfully getting either drugs banned or warnings placed on the uh, labels. Wow. Uh, because, you know, these things aren't, uh, aren't perfect. I really wish we could keep on talking about this, but unfortunately that does it for this edition of The Business of Life. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us here today, Lynette, Lena and Jay, and all of you for watching at home. We'll see you next time on The Business of Life. Bye-bye. The Business of Life is made possible by Better Money Habits. It's a free resource that helps you build practical knowledge and take control of your finances. Powered by Bank of America. See more at bettermoneyhabits.com.